Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code FRAMERATE5. And they now offer free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. Welcome to life. We regret to inform you that your previous existence ended on January the 14th, 2052, following a road traffic accident. However, your consciousness was successfully uploaded to the Life Network by your primary care provider. You may be experiencing some confusion. Please remain calm. Life contained. Your mental state is being temporarily adjusted in order to calm you. Please remain calm. Life contains over 30,000 unique activities networking with millions of other digitized minds and the ability to contact undigitized friends and family. Please accept these terms and conditions in order to continue life. Your attention is particularly drawn to Section 2, Usage Rules and Limitations, Section 9, Privacy, and Section 11, Restricted Mental Activities. Thank you. Please select a life plan. Tier 1 is our premium offering, allowing full, uninterrupted simulation of your pre-terminal state. It includes unlimited modification of your body plan, accelerated learning and recall, and full personal backup facilities. Tier 2 is our advertiser-supported offering. It contains many of the features of Tier 1, but at a significantly reduced cost. Some areas of the environment, such as the sky, may be replaced with targeted advertising, and your personal brand preferences may be altered to align with those of our sponsors. Tier 3 is our value offering. Thanks to our commercial partners, your experience at this tier is unlimited. However, some activity sensors and visual rendering options may be subject to a fair use policy. More complicated mental processes, including subconscious thought, creativity, and self-awareness, may be rate-limited or disabled at times of significant server load. Thank you. Your stored mind contains one or more patents that contravene the Prevention of Crime and Terrorism Act of 2050. Please stand by while we adjust these patents. Your stored mind contains sections from 124,564 copyrighted works. In order to continue remembering these copyrighted works, a licensing fee of $18,000 per month is required. Would you like to continue remembering these works? Thank you. Please stand by. Welcome to life. Go, 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 go! Uh, welcome to Frame Rate, episode 76. I'm Tom Merritt. Hey there, I'm Brian Brushwood. I think uh, part of my life backup didn't work. because I. Oh my gosh, how great is that little short story? That comes from TomScott.com. Go to TomScott.com and find him on Twitter and tell him what a brilliant little piece of art he put together there. Uh, my favorite part of that is the idea that copyrighted ex- works can exist in some form in your mind and need to be scrubbed for, fair li- for fairness during the reboot. Yeah, I like the way he turns fair use on its head, too. I can absolutely see that happening because copyright has been turned on its head. Piracy has been turned on its head. Why not? Just start saying, oh, fair use means the fair use of your brain by others who own the rights to the content. (laughs) Yeah, well, come on. I don't have the right to convince you of my side of the argument. It's fair use, bro. I also love the brand preferences. The brand preferences being changed. Yeah, exactly. Some of your brand preferences may be changed. You know what? That's fine. All of a sudden, I'm a Pepsi lover. I thought I'd like, no, I guess I'm a Pepsi. Okay, fine. Uh, let's start off with the big story. It's kind of it is a This just in, the big story. Uh, big story is that the Aereo case has kicked off last week. Uh, Aereo, just to bring you up to speed, if you don't know, Barry Diller-backed company that would like to uh, create... A service that gives you over the air free broadcast TV over the internet for around $12 a month. 
uh, and, and geofenced. So if you're in New York, you only get the New York channels that you would get if you actually stuck an aerial up. Uh, their legal argument is we have micro antenna. So every subscriber has their own antenna, and we're just acting as a, a big extension cord, essentially. So the networks don't like this because the networks get what are called retransmission fees from cable companies. Now, this was confusing to me, so I did a little research to figure out why. There was a law put forth in the early 90s called the Must Carry. Well, it was called something else, but it, it, it included a provision called Must Carry. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and Must Carry means that the cable providers were required to carry local television that's broadcast over the air. They couldn't not carry a local broadcast. It was designed right. to make sure that nobody got prejudiced against because everybody was subscribing to cable. It was the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act. Another provision of the same act allowed stations to opt out of must carry and charge the broadcasters. Oh, snap. So this is so the, the problem here is once Aereo comes to town, they can opt out of the cable setup and be like, no, you don't get local channels at all, Mr. Cable. Yeah. So so w- what's going on is the local stations are saying Aereo is a cable company. They're retransmitting our signal to their customers, just like a cable company. And they so they must carry everything unless we tell them we're opting out. We're opting out and they're still carrying us. We're taking them to court. Aereo's saying we're not a cable company. We're not retransmitting anything. We're getting an over-the-air signal on an antenna and then sending it to one person. Now, that's that's the, just the, a big extension cord. The, the other significant thing is that the, there's a question, and help me out if I, if I misread this, but there's a question because part of the reason that the Aereo is pushing forward with this is based on the precedent of a cable vision decision that uh, talked about DVRs and personal transmission of your own, of your own information. Uh, and what the, uh, the plaintiffs are saying are saying that's not the same at all because that involves time shifting. But because you're doing real-time retransmission, that's a whole different bag. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that involved time shifting not broadcasting. Cablevision was paying us to broadcast the signal. So we weren't, we weren't bringing that part up. All we were saying is that time shifting shouldn't be allowed, but the court said no, time shifting's allowed. Uh, so that, the, the broadcasters are saying Aereo's not doing the same thing. Aereo's broadcasting where they don't have permission to broadcast, and Aereo's saying we're not broadcasting. This is now, just yeah. a big, long antenna with an extension cord. Well, and, and, and a sling box and a DVR. Exactly, exactly. And I love the fact we you can always go back to the Slingbox, which which has has Slingbox ever suffered any kind of attack or, no, or no. lawsuit? See, it's so it's so clearly okay in my book. But here's the thing I like is reading the quotes from like NBC Universal talking about how this is gonna be the end of the world, and if this goes through, then things really are gonna change. And they mean it as a threat. And meanwhile, I'm just grinning, picturing the entire industry on fire. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think this is really funny. Matt Bond got most of the attention. Uh, all of the broadcast networks did a filing uh, as part of this case. Matt Bond is the one who said it makes little economic sense for cable systems and satellite broadcasters to continue to pay for NBCU content on a per-subscriber basis when, with a relatively modest investment, they can simply modify their operation to mirror Aereo's individual antenna scheme and retransmit for free. Well, yeah, you're right. Matt Bond, it does know. It, what's, not what's make sense for them. But it also doesn't make sense, really, for people to continue to pay for cable. But no, they do. There, it's yeah, just, I, that's, I, that's, you're just not talking about legalities anymore. You're just talking about business. Right. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. Now, I have to assume that there's some legal reason for this. But there is, is there a reason most local affiliates don't just offer their station 24-7 live streaming to anyone who wants to watch it? Uh, yes, probably because the people would watch it and then those advertisements would not count. Uh, okay, so the, the, there's a, there's a built-in incentive for that. Yeah, All right, you, know, w- like- you know, it's funny is back in the diary days, uh, Neil, you know, Nielsen probably would have been able to easily accommodate this, say, well, if you're watching it streaming, you just put down you're watching ABC. But essentially, now that they have all of these, these other ways of, of detecting oh, no. you. So the, uh, advanced, the advanced in technology. So they're tied <laughs> into, like, no, we're only counting what they watch on the television. At least, you know, that works for national. I'm not sure about local. But, yeah, that, that is probably why. There's also cable companies want to restrict how much an actual network can broadcast. I mean, we ran into this at Tech TV. We could not put more than 10 minutes 
per half hour of our programming on the internet for streaming. And this was back in the real video streaming days, right? I mean, this was when there was really no choice if you were going to watch it on television versus web, which one had the higher quality. Uh, and, and so there's still some of those restrictions that have to be negotiated as well. That is amazing. Now, here's the thing. Before these stories dropped this week, I was leaning pretty heavily on like, oh, man, Aereo is going to slam dunk this there. Obviously, it's just Slingbox only with the remote antenna that, that, you, that you yourself are renting. But now that I'm seeing so many, so, so many moneyed interests so angry over it, now I'm handicapping this a little bit more like, well, maybe Aereo in trouble. Where, where are you at on this, on their odds? Oh, I, I'm the same place I was at the very beginning, which is, uh, Aereo is backed by Barry Diller, and Barry Diller knows what the hell he's doing. Uh, and he's very powerful and influential. And he's up against all the broadcast networks, who obviously have a lot of money and are very influential. So this is Clash of the Titans. Hey, can uh, we, there's, there's, was, no, there's no guessing which, way, which side has the more power. It's really going to come down to what the judge thinks. And I think that's a total wild card. We need to promote this thing Don King style. Like, it's the battle of the bandwidths. Who will win? Cable or over the air antenna? Diller. Bond. One night. Well, more like several weeks in a courtroom. One night's sleep during the entire trial that will go on forever. You know, uh, just to give a little uh, due to the other arguments in the filings, uh, the the one was the business model would suffer. And really, the, the legal argument there is damages. They're trying to show what damages would happen. That doesn't say that what Aereo is doing illegal, but if it says if you determine that Aereo is doing something illegal, this is to show that it really damages our industry and it's, and it's worth stopping. Uh, number two, uh, they're, they're saying we can't pay sports leagues the huge fees to carry their programming because we won't make huge fees on retransmission. Uh, so, so your sport, they're threatening your sports could go away. Another damages argument. Uh, we won't make immediate money off people watching on the Internet. Uh, now, how about that sports thing real quick, like we determined in an earlier episode that sports sports enjoys an unfair subsidy from people who don't care about sports because well, everyone for cable for cable. It does for uh, cable. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, it might go away because you well, won't. No, have- yeah. But don't, don't forget what they're making is a damages argument. All right. All right. are saying. They're, they're not disagreeing with you, frankly. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they're just, just saying, like, we'll, we'll be financially hurt. Uh, number three, we won't make immediate money off people watching on the Internet uh, because they don't get rated. Uh, they, they make that argument we were talking about earlier. Nielsen doesn't rate the people who watch on the Internet. And since we haven't adapted yet, we're going to lose money that way. And if people can watch on TV on the Internet, they'll stop using Hulu. They, okay, they would damage us with Hulu. People would stop oh, watching our stuff there. That's patently untrue because uh, all Aereo does is, is live stream, right? It, it doesn't break down no, DVR. it has a DVR as well. Oh, it does. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, then maybe – see, I still don't see that though because the way DVR – DVRs naturally work because you have to decide before the show even comes out that you want to watch the show, which is fundamentally different from Hulu. Hulu, you can hear about a show that you missed oh, last – I mean, ago. seriously, if you DVR a show, do you also go watch it on Hulu? No, but – Well, there you go. I, I mean what they're saying is – if I am on the internet watching a show on Aereo on my DVR, I won't go to Hulu to watch it on the internet. In other no. words, in other words, I've now got access everywhere. Even though you could do this with a slingbox. But the problem is Hulu already has a blackout anyway. So if you're the, the things that I would DVR in advance are shows that I watch as close to real time as I'm physically I th- able. I think you really are missing their argument here, which right. is if I want to go watch a show on a laptop right now, my only choice is Hulu in their mind. Obviously, right. there's Slingbox and there's piracy, right? But, but really, you know, the majority of people probably would say, oh, if I want to watch a show on a laptop, I would have to go to Hulu. And they're right. saying, look, if Aereo comes along, they want to watch a show on their laptop, they can use Aereo. That undermines the audience for Hulu. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm not it, saying I, it's a good argument, but again, they're right. Fewer people yes, might yes, use Hulu yes, in yes, that situation. Correct. It is, is an unfortunate fact when you have yes. to deal with competition. Also, Boop. they said, look, pirates. For, <laughs> somehow, somehow, because people watch on the Internet, that means that there will be more piracy, which is that I think is the only ridiculous argument they made. They made a bunch of arguments about damages, uh, which are fine. Those are all fair arguments that, yeah, OK, if this whether this is legal or illegal, you might suffer a little bit uh, financially. That doesn't change whether it's legal or illegal. But if it was found to be illegal, you could easily show damages. Uh, but the fact that this would increase piracy is absolutely patently ridiculous. Right. The, the industry just hasn't caught on to the fact that you only need one fact, copy 
One copy. So I mean, having there- Aereo out there showing television doesn't increase the one copy that you need. What? The copy was already made. But Get it through your thick skulls. It's an infinitely copy of medium. I can't... Uh. More, more importantly, though, I think there's a very strong case to be made for the fact that the more high-quality legal alternatives there are, the less of an incentive there is for piracy, period. So I'm going to say that the reverse. Aereo will almost certainly reduce piracy because if you can, for a very small fee, have available all your programming on all your favorite stations, why would you bother to go and, and find a pirated copy when it's easier and, and almost as cheap just to get it from your area. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. Uh, if anything, it would reduce piracy, but uh, whatever. Uh, let's, let's move on to another big story. Kind of the same story, in a way. Yeah, it's- Stop everything. It's another big story. Uh, Dish Network unveiled their Hopper and Joey multi-room DVRs at CES, uh, and now uh, they're rolling them out, and they have auto-skip... For commercials, this only applies to the primetime anytime recordings, which uh, uh, start at, uh, I think, like 8 p.m. local time and run through 1 a.m. They might start at 7 p.m. Central. I don't know. Uh, But the idea is that the hopper automatically records primetime on the major broadcast networks. So even if you haven't set up an actual season pass, you'll be able to go and watch those shows. Now, in addition to that, they have something called commercial skip, which will automatically take out the commercials from any of those shows in the primetime anytime recording. I think that's rad and awesome. Now, now, so this is different from like your 30 second skips or whatever, because you don't even have to lift a finger. It just right. totally. No. You, well, you, you select, uh, please remove the commercials. It doesn't do mm-hmm. it automatically. You have to say, please do it. But then it does it. And then, you know, yeah, you don't have to press skip or anything after that now is that uh, i mean i wonder if there's a legal argument to be made because part of the reason that uh, the, the whole reason vcrs got under the wire was because it was uh, it was said all you're doing is time shifting and that made it okay and the whole idea is that you don't own this copy of the recording that you took Instead, you're only shifting time and if you fast forward well then i guess i guess that's okay because you're manually skipping over stuff but to edit out portions of the program, essentially you're treating it like your own content at this point. Is there a legal challenge to be made with this? I don't know if there's a legal challenge or not. I mean, there's always a legal challenge to be made, but I don't know if there's a good one to be it's made. It's a valid uh, one, sure. It only works after a day-long waiting period. So Dish can argue like, hey, you know what? After a day, you've got all your most of your quality ratings. It's not like this really affects that. Fox's Peter Rice uh, said this was a strange thing to do, but he didn't come out and openly condemn it. NBC's Ted Harbert uh, claimed that the new tool was an attack on our ecosystem and an insult to our joint investment in programming. I could see how they would have hurt feelings. And again, I apologize if I'm not very sensitive to these guys' feelings. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a pretty ballsy move for Dish uh, but Dish great. is also at the back end of the pack and trying to do things to attract an audience. Uh, and they're out there, you know, fighting with AMC and they own Slingbox and they 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 sell uh, units for their service that have Slingbox built in. So they're kind of on the cutting edge of this sort of stuff. Yeah. So the uh, Web eight four or eight one four three in the chat room says, "What's to stop a network from placing bogus commercial tags within the content of a show just to screw with people who use this?" The problem is that those commercial tags serve a purpose. There's a reason they invented them in the fir- first place, and uh, to to take them away would would ruin the whole point of them. Yeah, it would it would undermine the the network's ability to understand and rate what's going on. Right. Let's move to yet another big story. Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Uh, this ties into what you were saying about Aereo possibly reducing uh, piracy. Forbes has an article saying that uh, Game of Thrones has become the most pirated show on the Internet. And the author of this article, Eric Kane, says, HBO, you only got yourself to blame. You're not <clears throat> giving Internet subscribers a way to pay for this alone. You have to get a cable subscription, and then you have to pay for HBO. It's too much of a barrier. It's driving people to go and download it illegally. I'll tell you, you see this time and time again. You saw it in Prohibition. You see it now in the modern-day war on drugs. Whenever you have people who want something, 
and you have people who want to give people those things, but you have no ability for the two to meet, then a black market arrives. Now, obviously, HBO is saying, um, yeah, let's say for sake of argument, that the creators of Game of Thrones want it to get seen. HBO doesn't want to show it to everyone unless they meet special requirements, i.e. having a HBO subscription, and uh, the, the willing buyers and the willing sellers get together because the content wants to be seen and the people want to see it, and then it's, you can't stop it. And black don't, get, don't get us wrong. This is not meant as a just justification for breaking the law. For the no. Forbes writer is not saying, and therefore it's okay to go out and download it illegally. Absolutely not. What he's saying is, you know, forget that people are going to do immoral things for a moment. HBO doesn't want people to pirate their stuff, then they need to work harder to make it available. It's, Correct. it's just it's just a nature of reality. It doesn't say it's okay. It just says, you know what, it was what you were saying about the black market. Uh, if if there is a demand for something and you put too much of a restriction on it and it's not something that you can naturally restrict, uh, which which used to be true of television, you could naturally restrict it. It's not true anymore. Uh, right. And so HBO needs to do more to collect the money from the people who want okay. to give them the money. Let, let me play a devil's advocate here. Uh what if they're doing this exactly right? Because their end goal is to drive more subscribers to HBO. And if the calculus works out, that is like, yes, we have a tremendously large black market. And yes, we do need to pretend to be outraged about it. We need to try to shut these down. We need to make it difficult for people to get a hold of the programming. Uh, but we know for a fact that for every 100,000 pirated copies of Game of Thrones out there, we get 750 subscriptions and so it's profitable for us to use this as a as an uh, underground advertising wing of our business do you think there's any chance that that's what's going on oh yeah i'm sure there uh, there's probably every chance that at least one person at hbo believes that uh, right and 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 says look you know what okay so it's going to get downloaded illegally we're still making the optimum amount of money by doing it the way we're doing it uh that's why hbo has resisted uh and 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 not only resisted said flat out they're not going to make an internet only service anytime soon that you can just pay for without going to cable because they make more money making you go to cable. However, I would say, and part of it is their, their deals with cable companies. Cable companies will get upset at them uh, and, and start you know, wanting to take more of a cut of HBO if they start going to the internet. It, it lowers their negotiating leverage, which is why they make more money by doing it the way they're doing it. But right. that doesn't mean that there isn't a price at which they can demonstrate to the cable companies that it has no impact on subscriptions, uh, but still collects money from those who really wish to get it without buying cable. It may be such a large price that it's insignificant how many people would take advantage of it, but there is a price. Yeah, I don't know. Like HBO has been, you know, the number one most premier cable property for so long that I, I almost feel like from a branding perspective, it's beneath them to offer shabby uh, sponsored, you know, throw commercials in there, offer lower reduced quality. Like they mean, they mean one thing, exceptional quality cable programming for their original content. And I, I, I almost got to say, if I'm HBO, I almost would rather there be a giant black market because that's kind of a prestige thing too. It's like, we are the most popular yeah. thing, the illegal internet. And so maybe they're playing this exactly right. Maybe they're well aware of what they're doing. Uh, yet another big story implies that maybe they're not though. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I guess it's sort of the least important because it's our fourth big story. But uh, Time Warner Cable CEO Glenn Britt uh, said uh, in an interview with the New York Times uh, that it's a challenge for the average user to get Internet video into the living room. Uh, they, there's just no good way to get it off the Internet onto the big screen. And they said, uh, what about AirPlay? And Britt said, I'm not sure I know what AirPlay is. <laughs> See, okay, I'm glad that you I, I didn't have a chance to read this story. I just saw the headline and I was like, well, don't bag on him just because he didn't know what airplay is. But I didn't realize it was in the context of him being in the middle of decrying the lack of a solution to something that Apple has obviously done very well. Uh, Time Warner spokesperson uh, said the point you should keep in mind is that when you talk about technology that claims to be disruptive to the cable business, there are thousands of them. I think what's lost in the post is Glenn's point that replacing cable set top boxes with another box that gets TV, gets Internet content TV, is not the main objective of consumers. What consumers want is to get that connectivity without a box. I don't believe that. I, I don't, don't, I don't believe, believe that, at all. that either. I mean, I again, I think Time Warner is kind of 
angling in on something that's true, but I think they're showing just how little about this issue that they actually understand, uh, which is people want it to be easier to get their internet TV on their television. I would agree with that statement. So when you have to do, you have to do disclosures, like if you own stock in a company or something like that, right? Yeah. Do I need to dis disclose that my opinion of this story has nothing to do with the fact that perpetually Time Warner Cable craps out <laughs> the internet during every live broadcast? Hey, I know, it's not a bad, it's not a, not a bad thing. To okay, well, I'll, let me disclose that if Time Warner wants to fix my freaking cable, that would be delightful. If you guys could have it to where I don't suddenly disconnect in the middle of Twit broadcasts, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think that says it all. No, I, I, I think that this really is a demonstrative story, not because it shows that the Time Warner Cable CEO is an idiot. He's not. What it shows is that they really haven't thought through this. They've, they, know, they, they know the end piece of the argument. It's too hard to get internet television on cable. And so they try to say that without understanding why it's hard to get internet television on TV. I said on cable. Internet television on TV. It's not impossible. In fact, there's lots of good solutions. There's just not one solution that's elegant and does it for everyone. Even the spokesperson responding to The Verge uh, says, you know, uh, people don't want a box. No, no, no. People do. They'll be fine with a box if it's the if right people, box. Look, people, don't care. people don't care if it's a box or a pinata or a flower that they have to stick on their television as long as they can easily access the content they want when they want on the, on the video screen that they want. Nobody I, cares what the mechanism is as long as it's easy. I don't know if they want a flower. I want a flower. I want a magic flower that lets me watch anything. <laughs> All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. And the thing you need to know is right now in May, this is the best time to sign up for Squarespace. If you've been hearing us talk about it and you've said, oh, maybe I'll go over there and try it out. I mean, I know I don't need a credit card to try it out. It's free to try it out. And I can just import my blog with one of their easy tools, mess around, see how good it looks with their templates. Uh, now is definitely the time because annual plans give you a free domain, a new lowest price, and an additional 10% off when you use the code frame rate five. Free domain registry. You can have your own domain name when you sign up for Squarespace for a, a year. That's, you know, that costs you $15 and up at lots of places. Uh, and Squarespace recently reduced their prices. So some plans start as low as $8 a month if you just want to go monthly you got to go try it out. It's the easiest way. I mean, Brian knows uh, the NSFW show audience creates thousands of websites on Squarespace a minute. They're pretty good. In fact, maybe we should open like an NSFW show consulting firm where they see the problem is, is, is NSFW crowds like they're geniuses of setting up these sites super fast, but they're so easy. It's like, what would it, what would a Squarespace consultant do? Just tell you like, I don't know, log in, pick, pick one of these. Type, type your stuff in there. Yeah. It's like you're done. Just start a, using it because bucks. it's pretty self-explanatory. Although, I mean, Squarespace also offers 24-7 support. So you kind you of can get fancy because they, they let you do the custom CSS and all that stuff. Well, Maybe that's. Yeah. But I mean, you don't really need a consultant because they have really good support. That's all I'm saying. That's true. That uh, is true. Anyway, go try it out, folks. Squarespace.com. And uh, like I said, if you want 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, and don't forget about the free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions, use that offer code FRAMERATE5 to get 10% off. That's Squarespace.com. We thank them for their support of whatever the show's name is. FRAMERATE, right. I, I almost <laughs> forgot. I really did. Let's, uh, let's, let's go right to Slipstream. Thank you for their support of Tech News Today. Uh, <laughs> Nintendo is pulling the plug on their 3D TV service in Japan. So no 3D this on is it. your 3DS in the United States. I this mean, not, not no 3D, but no 3D TV service. This is the beginning of the end. This is, this is the end run of the people who are so desperate to come up with a new novel gizmo to sell us TVs in our living room. They overstepped it. They saw the 3D hype in the movie theaters, thought they could duplicate it in the, in the living room, but the technology of the living room is nowhere near the same quality of what's in the theater, and consumers are responding. It's painful. It gives you a headache. It's, you feel silly sitting there with goggles on in your own living room, and I, this is just the first as far as I'm concerned. You think you got a headache now? Wait till you get new DVDs and Blu-rays with the new FBI warning that's unskippable. Oh, my gosh. Uh, U.S. government uh, said last week uh, they will roll out two new copyright notices, one to warn and one to educate. Uh, Immigration's and custom enforcement is now involved. Homeland Security gets a badge on here. 
uh, and it's they're they're essentially longer and unskippable. Uh, this this man, I'll tell you, it I think made it's twenty total seconds. By the way, the best thing that you and I ever did for frame rate was watch The Wire because it fundamentally, I see stuff like this that's so patently stupid that does nothing but anger legitimate consumers, and I just my mind flashes to every meeting where every person did something that sounded good on paper so that they could look important for something. You know, it's like I could totally picture the meetings where this went down. Like and so and the politician who wants to be able to say, hey, I've made strides to stop piracy. We were instrumental in putting advanced warnings on DVDs everywhere. That was my legislation. I feel good about it. It's like it's so much crap. It's so much crap and it does nothing but ruin legitimate content. Now look, I'm all for fighting piracy, but I do think that what the European Union is doing with the land invasions in Somalia is a much better way to address piracy than... <laughs> Wait, are these two different things here? It's different, different piracy. Oh, I'm different talking about piracy. the piracy that actually threatens people's lives. That's yes. the one we should be focusing on. That's no. the one, Yeah, the one that does actual physical harm to somebody. Yeah, yeah that's okay. the one. Let's move on to Tube Tops. LG, uh, remember we were talking about how they've got Google TV uh, coming? Well, they've, they've been showing it off. VentureBeat has a review, and they say it's pretty slick. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, they showed it off at Internet Week in New York, and the difference is that LG has put their own sort of patina on it, their own interface. They've included 3D. They're the only Google TV function that actually has 3D because it's a 3D television. I know you don't yeah. care. Uh, and they've got a magic remote, so you're not using a big keyboard. You can just kind of, you know, use motion control. It does have a keyboard on the on the flip side of it. Uh, and um, they they uh, have a faster processor, so it actually works a lot faster than the Logitech's or the Sony's. Dual maybe core, before. dual core processor on there. This is the beginning of the next wave of Google TVs. Uh, by the way, you heard me talk about it. I I sat in on that uh, that Google TV panel uh, for the release of the Sony stuff. Uh, Sony showed off the the new remote on did, the new. Did you get paid for that? No, no, not at all. Okay, I just wanted to, that's a disclosure and, right there. Yeah. And, and in fact, I don't even own a Google TV. I'm there, you know, yeah. just, just as somebody who is, is a fan of what's happening with anything that shakes up, you know, traditional cable media. But, um, uh, but yeah, man, they, they showed me the, 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 that remote. We'll talk about it when it comes out, but, but that remote looks awesome. And I'm excited to see some more powerful Google TV offerings because that's been my one gripe is I don't want to dive in on an underpowered $99, $99 box. Yeah, it's a motion control remote. It supports gestures and has a built-in microphone. So it's, it's, it's very nice. Uh, onward to Microsoft uh, having some success as the most popular video player in the United States, at least uh, according to a report from Freewheel, an online video ad company uh, that tracks these sorts of things. They say that Xbox is the most popular way people watch online video in the United States. 28.2% of total video views by non-PC or Mac devices, uh, followed up by the iPad, then the iPhone, then Android devices, and then the iPod Touch. Yeah, now keep in mind that they are only measuring, quote-unquote, professional content that runs with ads. That doesn't necessarily mean right. that it's, uh, you know, because it, it is, I, I don't know what other, I guess the other examples would be people who are watching pirated content or... Uh, or just YouTube videos. YouTube videos, you know, sure. Just general YouTube videos. Um, and of course, they're also not measuring the PC, because I think I think the PC would totally dwarf. Like, have you started, do you watch any movies just on your PC, like... Is there ever a time when you could go to your living room and watch a movie, but instead you just watch it in front of your PC? Not movies. I, I have definitely done that with television shows, even recently uh, done that with television shows. But not, yeah. not, not, not for movies. Movies, I always either use the Google TV uh, or my iPad. No, I see. I'll watch movies in my office, but then again, I've got a 37-inch HD TV right in front of me as my primary monitor, so it's easy for me to do that. But okay. I agree. Like I think televisions... Uh, part of the reason is that it's easy to multitask while you're watching TV. You could kind of have it on on one side and half be working on something on the other side. So for that, that, that seems like it lends itself well to PC viewing. Now, if you're saying, well, I could never uh, be as rich as Brian Brushwood and afford that large television, uh, don't forget about the IKEA Upleva TV, uh, which we've talked about before. It's an all-in-one TV. It's coming in spring 2012 worldwide. Uh, it's going to be in the next few months in France, Germany, Poland, Italy. You can get it from 24 to 46 inch TVs. The, the news today, we've talked about it before, is that uh, it will come now with some big name partners that have apps on the television. YouTube, Vimeo, Daily Motion, among others. 
I love the fact that you keep. I don't know where this this myth of Brian Brusher, the one percenter, is coming know. from. Because it's so, <laughs> because I know it's so not true. It just appeals I know. to me. But what, it's what's funny is I'm getting tweets right now. Somebody just tweeted me saying, "Try to be two percent, buddy, instead of one <laughs> percent." <laughs> I think that's no. You are the two percent. <laughs> okay, fine. Good enough. All right, let's check film film. Uh, Berlin has a website called moviepilot.com, which is making a big push into the United States and wants to be able to let you follow the development of new movies, uh, news and rumors, and also plug the film studios in for a way to find out about potential fans who are interested in the projects. So is this a case where they want to kind of broker uh, relationships between super fans and and people who have something that they need lieutenants to go out there and explode? Or is, is this like a, a fanboy service? I mean, I guess that's exactly what it is. But it's um, I, I think this is a really interesting idea. This has to be a place where uh, they can leak information about upcoming projects, I guess, or they can they can. Help me out on this. Is this studio officially letting people know, or is this a lot of like underground information? Well, yeah. What Movie Pilot is doing is saying, look, IMDb has a very locked down way of getting this information out. It's only right. stuff that's verifiable, that's been public. What we're going to do is we're going to bridge the gap. We're going to bring in the rumors. And, and the best-known news and what we think we know. And we're going to get folks in from Facebook. It's very integrated with Facebook to follow the movies that way. And then we're going to talk to the studios and say, hey, you got a lot of people interested in your project here. You want to put out some official stuff, put it out here and, and get the folks who are most uh, passionate and, and interested in your movies uh, to get more excited about it. Okay. All right. No, this is good. I hope uh, we wish them success. Now, do you think this is good? Uh, CBS is going to come out with a sitcom. This, you know, we're starting to hear in the upfronts of all of the uh, fall shows that they're going to do. Uh, CBS has a sitcom called Friend Me, starring uh, Christopher Mintz-Plass. You may remember him as McLovin from Superbad. And Nicholas Braun, who is in Red State, as best friends who move from Bloomington, Indiana to Los Angeles to work for Groupon, even though Groupon's in Chicago. I mean, if they're in Bloomington, Indiana, it would have been a much shorter move to move to Chicago. Right, but, but none of this is the real is the real story here. The real story is the brilliant title because it's Groupon. I suppose you want to have the title kind of reflect the fact that it's a, an Internet startup. And maybe uh, maybe they should call it uh, Friend Me. Yeah, it sounds like it's about Facebook. And you know what I think happened? I think they came up with a story that said, let's do a show about a social network because that social network movie was really big. We'll call it Friend Me. It'll be about oh, yes. two folks who move out to L.A. to work for the startup because we'll do it in L.A. because it'll be easier to shoot and there'll be a lot more you know, uh, fun location shoots we could do. Uh, and let's see if we can get one of the Internet companies to sign on and give us a little money and we'll make it about them. And so they I went to Facebook and Zuckerberg said, you know what? My sister's actually really into TV production. Uh, I, I don't think we want to be involved in this right now. Thank you very much. And they eventually found Groupon who were like, yeah, OK, we'll write you a check. Make it about Groupon. I absolutely guarantee you that's exactly how it went. You are a true wizard of where's your crystal ball, sir? I have. No, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> um, this is an NSFW show. <laughs> Let's move on uh, to paid content talking about a self-published novel getting picked up by major film stars. Uh, we're not talking about Fifty Shades of Grey, which actually is it's also true of Fifty Shades of Grey. Universal picked up the rights to that. Uh, but 20th Century Fox has acquired the film rights to Wool, a five-part science fiction series by Hugh Howey. And uh, Deadline Hollywood says Ridley and Tony Scott's free or Scott Free are partnering on the deal. Dude, this is great. I'm loving I'm loving the existence of uh from ground up uh science fiction. I love the content, the, the, these bizarre creative ideas that develop these niche audiences and then get picked up by people who have a chance to take their stories to to the big, bigger world. I mean, th how exciting is this time? This is great. No, I love this too. I mean, I know it's an exception not the rule. Uh but it's certainly something that I think was much more unlikely to have happened. 10, 15 years ago. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's uh, also talk about how we almost lost Toy Story. Yeah. Do you want to play a clip of this? You want, you want, uh, Chad, could you just kind of jump to maybe like uh, Definitely don't make it full screen. Yeah, just right there. Just jump in 
and take a listen. This is them talking about uh, somebody accidentally uh, doing a delete all command on the Unix box. I remember thinking, wow, this is really bad, but no worries. We're going to get our backups. And now, this is a dramatization that you're We realized doing. that the backups we had were actually bad. What do you mean, backups have failed for the last month and we don't have any backups? Uh, at this point, Galen mentioned to me in a meeting that she thought she had a copy of the film at her house. So, as a mother who wanted to see her children, I needed to have a computer at home. And so I would copy... This is a very out of context. I don't know computer. if it's making much sense to you. What happened was Pixar's Oren Jacob and Galen Sussman, uh, during development of Toy Story 2, found out that someone had ran RM Star on the drive where all of Toy Story 2's files were being stored, erasing about a year's worth of work. And as you may have heard in that, that outtake, they realized the backup files were bad. Uh, the, the backup files had been running, but they had not been running correctly. So the backup files were of no use. Uh, luckily, Sussman, as she was getting to right when we, uh, we stopped watching, had a copy of the film on her computer at home, which had saved the day. Yeah, yeah, barely. Well, and there's even there's even a, a harrowing moment when they grab her computer from the car or from the house, put it in the car, and they're driving as fast as they can. But then, meanwhile, my, meanwhile, they're terrified of banging up the what might be the last archive of all of the assets in there. It's uh, it was it was a cute little story. Yeah, definitely go uh, take a look, check it out. Hey, man, have you seen this? Uh, the hype for NBC's Revolution. Have you seen this thing? I just after you put it in the lineup today, I, I took a look at it, and I had two reactions. One is which, of which is, I love the idea of this story. All the electricity disappears, and they jump 15 years ahead, and suddenly the world is just gone to seed, right? Right. Uh, because there, everything we've built society on no longer exists. It's a little bit of a Jericho feel, right? right. Suddenly, well, and, and suddenly to me, infrastructure thought, is gone. Aesthetically, I thought immediately of Logan's run, those scenes where they're walking around in Washington, D.C., and just everything's overgrown all over the place. And all of a sudden, the, the functionality of everything changes when there's no technology behind it. Uh, I, I'm with you. I love the idea of this, but I smell your butt. Go. Uh, yeah, this, uh, <laughs> this presentation, at least this trailer, does not make it look like it's a well-told story. Uh, it looks like it falls into every cliché. Uh, it looks like it's just kind of, uh, kind of ec- everything is going to be expected. It's got some good actors. It's got the dad from Twilight in it. Uh, it's got, uh, what, what's his name from Breaking Gus, Bad? Yeah, Gus Fring. Gus Fring. Gus. Well, what's his actual name? His actor no, name. he's actually Gus Fring. They actually have the, the actual meth dealer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and so I love the idea of like, oh, yeah, New York overgrown with trees. And I, 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 lo- I may watch it just for the disaster porn element of it. Uh, but this, it's really overworked and, and I, yeah. Okay. So we all rely on electricity, but I'll, it's I'll tell you what. unbelievable that it happens this way. Yeah. Well, and again, you can sell me on an unbelievable story, but you just got to give me clues that make me want to lose myself in it. And the problem is everybody's too pretty and there's too much focus on young, pretty people. And, and, well, even and that- the, yeah, all, everything is overgrown on the skyscrapers, but inside the houses, everything is clean and nice. And all they do is light candles. I don't know. Well, and, even, and look at the way everything's shot. Everything is shot so cleanly. I mean, every, I mean, there's a way to convey a sense of panic and grit. But then again, you're not going to do that for a prime time. I'm you sorry. See. We would have axes. We would have iron. We would have metal. Uh, and, and we would have ways to clear the brush from around yeah. the skyscrapers and figure out how to, you know, live amongst them. It's not like all the people died. So some of this, I don't know, just, just strikes me as a little off. Uh, but yeah. I, I don't know. I'll, get, I'll give it a shot. I, you know, I like a, a good disaster story. So yep. let's I check agree. in on the summer movie draft. Not looking so good for me, Brian. After uh, two weeks, I'm still not in first place with the Avengers. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I think we can call it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, Twit TV is now calling. It's it's plenty. There's plenty of time left, but it's clear we can now call that Tom Merritt is the winner of the summer movie no, draft. Absolutely not. I I, uh, I I'm kidding about not being in first place yet. I'm doing very well. Uh, Avengers has grossed 373 million. Uh, hasn't quite passed up the Hunger Games, but it's almost caught it in just two weeks. So I'm I'm extremely, as they say, chuffed in England. Yeah. Uh, oh man, you have result. so much momentum. Here's the question: Do you think uh, two of my bigger bigger movies are coming out? 
this weekend, and I think Avengers is going to stomp them for a third week in a row. Dark uh, Dark Shadows just came out, but is the Dictator and Battleship? Battleship has been the one that you've seen promoted. You know, Subway has had Battleship games for freaking three months now. Like it's supposed to be a big summer movie, but I can't imagine it having a chance of opening higher than the the Avengers. I'm going to go see the Avengers again I this think, week. I think Battleship, the folks behind Battleship did not count on just how popular the Avengers would be. They figured it would be tailing off by the third week and they'd be safe. And I really think that the that Battleship would have done better if it had been put off for another two or three weeks. Uh, yep. But instead, I think it's going to suffer. I really do. I don't think this is over by any stretch. The Hunger Games is, st- is strong enough at $387 million to keep Scott Johnson in this with his other... He's got Snow White and the Huntsman coming up too, right? Three yeah, that's gonna- was not bad for him, $41 million. So he's strong. And of course, Sarah Lane uh, has got The Dark Knight. And of course, you have a nice wide... Uh, variety. Veronica and Justin have a little higher, uh, a steeper hill to climb uh, than everybody else, but I wouldn't count them out either. They, they both yeah. have uh, Prometheus, The Amazing Spider-Man. They both have top films in there. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Uh, I started Remember, a... I have The Raven, which just barely passed Lockout as one of my four movies, so I'm weak on the back end. Oh, no. Your Raven got ahead of my Lockout? Yeah, it did. Just barely. All right. Oh, well. But Lockout's like your eighth movie, and it's my fourth, so... <laughs> Makes a difference. Right on. Uh, hey man, what we uh, got? Yeah, what, what are we watching? We need, just need to short. What are you watching? I, I like it. Just needs to be less less of this. <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's find out what you've been watching uh, besides Legends of Korra. Uh, yeah, of course, Legends of the Korra. It's just getting better. It's getting better and better. It is my favorite show on television right now. It is. We get all excited, and every time an episode ends, we're just we're just like, ah, a whole nother week. Uh, I'm, I am plowing through Sons of Anarchy, and I know I'm getting near the end, uh, getting caught up, but I don't know how many episodes there are because they just keep hitting next episode, and that's getting good now that they finished up an arc I wasn't a fan of. Um, uh, rewatched The Incredibles with the kids. So good. Best movie it, it may be the best. It's the perfect superhero movie. And we already talked about this before. But the big thing was I, I watched Metropolis finally. And I watched it with, with my eight-year-old. And the first one that showed up, it's on Netflix Instant Streaming. I had never seen it before. And the first version that popped up was the one from the 1980s that was attempting to be the most complete version of Metropolis to that date where they even took um, – they, they shot some original footage that they blended in. They colorized parts of it. They gave it a a what they called a modern score at the time, which is now just sounds, sounds like delicious. the 80s. Yeah. 80s, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but that almost made this even more precious in this jumbled up kind of way, right, where, where you had this mashup of all these different things. But we watched the whole thing. And it was, it was like, oh, okay. And then all of a sudden I noticed that the, the suggested next viewing was the version that came out like last year that was based largely on a print that they found in Argentina from 2008. And uh, uh, it is far superior. Everything makes sense. There's entire sections that weren't represented before. And it is stunning to realize, uh, if you don't know, the story with Metropolis was about like three minutes after its theatrical release, it was massively chopped down, including inc- large elements of it that that were pretty fundamental to the actual story. So the end result was the movie that most people saw didn't make a lot of sense. It was nothing like, uh, was it Fritz Lang? Was that the name yeah. of the director? Nothing like what Fritz Lang intended. Uh, it is worth it. If you've never seen Metropolis, go see, don't see the 1980s version. See the one that was released in the last couple of years. Uh, because it's it's amazing just to watch the whole thing and realize that this was a hundred years ago. This was movie making a hundred years ago, and there's stuff that I just wouldn't have thought was possible in film back in that in those early crude days. I uh, watched the uh, season finale of Fringe. It was uh, it was very good. I uh, I don't think the season was as good as last season. It was it was it was a little more. I don't know. They 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 rebooted some things, uh, and and it felt like we were just trying to get to the end of that story, and we did get there, and I was satisfied with the ending. Uh, but I am very much looking forward to the final season uh, next year. They're doing thirteen episodes. There's a whole new story arc uh, that they teased in one future looking episode that I can't wait to see play out. Uh, but I, I, I enjoyed it. I, I'm, I'm not over the top with this season. I think last season was was much better. 
but this season was good enough to keep me excited about Fringe, and I'm definitely looking forward. Yeah, you, to that you had season. mentioned before that this season had a lot more Monster of the Week. Is that is that grinding on you, or are you okay with no, that? No, it has nothing to do with it. The the Monster okay. of the Week part is is not the thing that I, I disliked. It was the fact that we had to start a whole new story and try to retell it, but it, I, it's a little spoilery to explain why I didn't like it as much. But essentially, this new story had too many questions and elements from the old story without advancing the old story. I wanted to see that old story keep going. Uh, Got it. And I, and I think that that's going to happen in the next season. But there is actually a new story next season that I think is even better than all of them. Or at least has the potential to be. Uh, and Sherlock. Uh, I finally, PBS has, uh, has broadcast the first two of the, th- the three new Sherlocks. Absolutely fabulous. The first one uh, w- with uh, the, the uh, what, what is it, uh, Belgravia? Uh, yeah, the, the, the woman. Yeah. I forget what it was. Yeah. Uh, absolutely fabulous. He, he's got a foil. You never know who's actually smarter than the other. Uh, keeps you guessing all the way to the end. Uh, brilliant. How did the Baskerville, a, a different story not quite as much showing off sherlock's intellect and the banter but very impressed how they're able to tell an iconic story that we all know so well even if we've never read it it's ingrained in our consciousness through uh, illusions and they tell it in a fresh new way that makes perfect sense and is actually fairly true in certain ways to the original yeah yeah and uh you're right it's uh i, I think baskervilles is the is the least awesome of the three new ones, but it also takes on the most interesting challenge because it's one of the best known stories. You know, a lot of the other ones I haven't read all the Sherlock Holmes stories, so so I don't see all the little nods they do to the original story. But because I knew it with How to the Baskervilles, it was really fun to see the little uh, tricks that they pull. And now it's time for feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Frame Rate. Yeah. Our first email to Frame Rate at Twit.tv says, Hello, Brian and Tom. Is it possible that studios allow movies to be made knowing that they will make no money on them and take the loss as a write-off, i.e. John Carter of Mars? What are your thoughts? Thanks. Love the show. A weekly done of internet TV goodness with a dash of bourbon. Michael Thomas. I think you meant dose. Oh, dose. dose. I'm sorry. My my mistake, Michael. A weekly. But dose. it is. But you know what? You're right. It is a weekly done. We're done. We're done. With it, TV uh, every no, time. I don't think episode. studios make movies knowing that they will make no money on them and take the loss as a write-off. However, I do think that studios do account for the ability to write things off when they do the calculus about how much money they're going to make in a movie, if that makes and any keep sense. keep in mind, also, that applies not only for movies that definitely are financial disasters, like John, uh, John Carter, but it also applies to movies that, on paper, should look like they make a ton of money. And this is, this is the kind of thing that, uh, that you know, Kevin Smith rails against and why he went totally independent with Red State, uh, which, by the way, did you ever watch Red State, Tom? Nope. So good. It is, the, it is unlike Too many any- good things to watch. That's going to be my new yep. answer every time you ask me if I've seen something you love. And I haven't. <laughs> anyway, but the point is, uh, they're now they do. They've made a science. All these studios are breaking out their separate LLCs to bill one side of one company to another side of another company, so that when it comes time to paying royalties or to uh, to uh, certainly for tax time, they could show that that movies ended up making no money. So you do see a lot of that. But I don't think anybody sets out to make a disaster. I don't think we have a real life producers moment. No, happening I don't now. think they can make enough money off of it with just a write-off to make it worthwhile. I think they. Uh, I think what you may be thinking of is they will say, well, this will lose money at the box office, but we'll make it up later in DVD sales or merchandising, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That definitely happens. Uh, and I guess also it's too easy It's too easy to write off movies that actually are making money. I mean, so if, why would you need it to actually lose? Why would you lose- plan to make money? If Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, our next email uh, is an Aereo user. Yeah, here we go. This one comes from Chris, who says, uh, Hi, Tom and Brian. You've often spoke of Aereo. I just completed a beta membership. Sign up, and if you'd like any information or screenshots, please let me know. At this time, Aereo runs only on iOS devices via Safari browser, oddly enough. Wow, so they don't even have their own app. And Roku, the interface is easy enough to use. The recording is straightforward. It allows for 40 hours of of record, although it hasn't marked anything off the 40 hours available that I've recorded so far. The stream quality is rather like Roku's Netflix app. It starts off rough, and then the adaptive streaming brings the quality up to a preset level, which was quite good even at low levels. They offer low, medium, high, and ultra-high quality levels. 
Um, Aereo allows up for up to five devices to be assigned to the account. As has been mentioned on the show before, they are limiting signups to NYC, parentheses, although I'm not in NYC. Shh. And then I became very glad that I didn't give Chris his last name. Uh, yeah. So what do you think the story with that is? The story with what? Well, the fact that uh, that uh, apparently it's limiting signups to NYC, but Chris appears to not be in no, he's NYC. he's probably just using a proxy. He's probably just spoofing an IP address from New York City. It's not that hard. Okay, well, you certainly took the mystery out of that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, finally, Zach in Colorado Springs. Uh, Eva had mentioned early in the show last week that she was a cord cutter and watches Hulu all the time because of this. Then she mentions that she's watching the new season of Game of Thrones that is behind by three episodes. How is she doing this if she doesn't have a cable or satellite connection? Just curious. Well, I think the answer is obvious that she has a next door neighbor who has HBO and that she physically goes over, knocks on the door of her neighbors and sits and watches the program the same way you watched HBO when you didn't have it when you were a kid at a friend's house. Yeah, Duh. I think that. Yeah, that's probably true. I actually think that is true. I know that Brian's winking when he says this. but I'm it's not winking. I'm true. saying seriously. That's what's going on. And seriously, uh, we are at the end of the show, except Brian has some grave reservations about Game of Thrones that we are going to talk about in a spoiler zone shortly. But if you do not want to be spoiled on season two of Game of Thrones because you don't have a next door neighbor to go over and watch with, uh, then you'll want to bow out now. Thanks everybody for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash FR. We stream on Tuesday mornings, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And of course, uh, you can always email us. Our email address is framerate at twit.tv. We'll talk to you next time. Before, before we start, right as we're going into spoiler zone, Web 2441 says, man, I hope they don't spoil Soylent Green for me. <laughs> and then on oh. cue. Uh, yeah, so, okay, you are bugged by what I consider to be minor differences between the book and the story this year. Tell, I, tell I, me what those differences are that are bugging you. Maybe, maybe okay. I'm just not paying enough attention and they will bug me when they're pointed out. Well, and keep in mind... Uh, uh, there's a difference. I'm not annoyed by it. I don't dislike it. I'm growing concerned. And I'm almost certain that this is fueled by how unhappy with the second season of Walking Dead I got. I mean, the changes, I, I would say that the experiment with The Walking Dead at this point, uh, it was it was not a success to decide to keep characters alive for so long when they died in the book. I'm not a fan of the fact that they're killing off one character I, when they killed off Dale. I, I actively hate that they ruined what I loved about Andrea. Now, uh, now keep in mind, that's all for me as somebody who's familiar with the source material and seeing what they're changing in the, uh, in the, in the final product. Uh, and, and maybe if it was done right, maybe if, maybe if the, the episodes were more interesting, I would be okay with it. But my experience has left me very gun shy with the walking dead. And as a result, even seeing those little changes uh, is is driving me nuts because and and it maybe part of it is colored by how long it's been since I've read the second book. It's Clash of Kings is the second book, right? For Game of Thrones, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's like there's all kinds of things that are happening for motivations that are different. Uh, I understand that that they're building up some kind of of relationship between Egret and Jon Snow, but the whole that all happened in the original book after he was given. Uh, and this is spoilery for anyone, you know, it's future spoilery. Like in the in the book, Jon Snow was tasked with going out and living among the wildlings and and learning their ways. And that's why he runs into Egret, right? I mean, he didn't meet Egret before that moment. Oh, I see what you're saying, right? They've collapsed that storyline uh, a bit and, and accelerated it so that he's not actually at the battle uh, right. Well, and, and and that's significant because it changes his motivation. Because in in the in the book, he's tasked with living among the wildlings, and while while he is uh, torn about his vows, he also was explicitly told to live among them. So so if and when he gets to you know to touch in a lady, it, it it's under this you know when he finally collapses and gives up, 
He's like, well, this is all under the auspices of I'm doing my job yeah, for the. Well, you for, haven't like, let the story finish playing out yet. Yes, I I agree that it's a change from the book, but it may. I don't see any reason why it has to be a change in the motivations of the underlying story. If it gets to that point where it's like, oh, really? That's the reason he ended up doing that. I'll be upset too. But I I can see a way where this story ends up being spiritually true to exactly what the book is, and I'm not somebody that needs it to be literally true to the book. So he's met a greet. She said, you know nothing, Jon Snow. He's conflicted. Conflicted. Let's let's let it play out before we judge whether that storyline has been ruined. And again, or not. that's why I'm not saying I'm not okay. saying anything's done bad. This is these are my concerns because it seems on track for for you know like if something were to happen now under this situation, then it wouldn't be the, him doing his job for the Black Brothers. It would be him finally giving up and deciding to fall in love with a chick. Uh, and that that that's very that's very different. And again, these are concerns, not not this thing. And also this whole. Um, uh, the whole stealings of dragons scenes, the killing of of, of Eerie earlier, uh, which means things won't happen because I think it's significant that Daenerys uh, had a relationship with with Eerie at one point, uh, and uh, yeah, and and the whole like I I I don't remember this. I I I don't know. It would be too big of a change. For Again, them. I think we want to see how they get her into uh, the uh, the House of Shields or whatever that uh, – what's the – House of the, the Undying. Yeah, right. House of the Undying. That's where you did your first scam school, House of the Undying. Uh, the, uh, I think when we see – when we again, I'm, I, I understand your worry, but I'm like, I also see how this will end up being the same story that we get from House of Undying and actually be a little easier to explain in television than it would be in a book. Uh, whereas in a book, you can you can have a lot of motivations uh, explained in text. You, it's harder to, to just have that stuff read on television. So this gives you a direct motivation that you understand. If you don't haven't read the book, why she's going to the House of the Undying. Right. Um, so I, I, again, I'm okay with that. I want to see how it plays out first. But I, I, I see I see wh- I see what you're reacting to here. And, it's, all, and I'm I see saying, why. all I'm saying is that is that the changes are getting bigger and I, I'm hoping that what will happen is we'll have this once we get over this gap and it kind of folds back and now we're back on task with everyone's motivations and we're all focused in the same direction. Uh, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, wow, we're really spread out right now, guys. That's all. That's all I'm. It's, it's all. Well, and, and look at what's happening with Arya. Uh, I actually like now per face for radio absolutely disagrees with me. He doesn't like the way they've changed Arya's story. Arya is one of my favorite characters in the books. Oh, no, I love it. I love, I love it. that she's actually re- interacting with Tywin Lannister. It just makes that so much richer and so much more, you know, like, oh, my gosh, is she going to screw this up? Is he going to figure out who she is than it was in the book? And I think that's cool. No, I, I actually agree with that, and I think it does a really good job of taking so much of Arya's story is happening, uh, you know, very quietly and in her head while she's perpetually afraid. And there's, there's, um, it doesn't seem like, as I remember it, there was a lot of opportunity for dialogue. It seemed a lot of it was her just on the run and being quiet. Yeah. Whereas this offers a chance to give uh, internal motivations on on her side of things. Uh, and we're so, still getting, you know, her her. I don't want to say what he is, but we're still getting her friend who's granting her the three wishes. So. That's all. Yeah. That's all good. I'm. I'm all good. And you know, the the final thing I would say is, uh, Eileen ran into this with True Blood, where she's read all the Charlene Harris uh, books, and then she watches True Blood, and they change everything in that show. I mean, it is a, it's an alternate universe. It's an entirely different thing. Game of right. Thrones is actually staying very true to the books, and that's why I don't mind that they're deviating a little bit because none of these have pissed me off yet. None of them have fundamentally changed anything in the universe. But I understand what you're saying is like, but they might. And if they yep. do, I will be bugged by that too. And it, and you are. You're totally rea- reacting to Walking Dead. I get that. Yeah. I'm just, I've, I've been hurt, Tom. I've been hurt. And I'm not ready to give <laughs> I've myself been hurt to by love just, before. just yet. All right, folks. Thanks uh, for sticking around for the spoiler zone. And uh, like I said at the end of the regular show, you can find us on twit.tv slash FR or streaming live at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern every Tuesday morning. We'll see you then.